Okay, thanks very much uh, for the invitation to speak here. So I come much more from the microbiome side of things. I'm assistant professor at the Jackson Laboratory, and my slides aren't showing. Let's see. I'm sorry? Ah, okay, there we go. All right, yes, so that's me, that's Jax. You heard from Ed earlier this morning. So in my group at the Jackson Laboratory, so we use primarily shotgun metagenomic sequencing to reconstruct these microbial communities in terms of who's there, so the composition, as well as the function, so what are they doing? And so basically what we do is we take microbiome samples, so here a skin swab, um, I do a lot of my work in the skin microbiome. We make a bulk sequencing sample, then sequence it very deeply, and then use different computational approaches to reconstruct draft metagenomes that in essence, re essence represent the different species, uh, the original species in the skin microbiome, and in essence creating a kind of a high resolution parts list of the genes and the genomes in the skin microbiome. And so with this kind of data then, what we can do is we can uh, create these very high resolution compositional maps of the, the skin microbiome at many different skin sites. So these are the different sites shown here. And what the consensus pie charts are showing are basically the different viruses, the fungi, the bacterial species at that particular skin site. And so one of the striking findings about the, the healthy skin microbiome is this very strong site specificity, where the composition as well as the function of the, uh, of the microbial community is really very strongly driven by the physiologic characteristics of the skin. So for example, whether it's an oily site like our face or our torso, moist like our feet, or dry like our hands and forearms. And so you can see just by eye the heterogeneity in the composition of the pie charts um, in the figure there. When there's skin disease, what we see is a very significant shift to kind of these core characteristics of the site specificity. So this is just a snapshot of a study I did earlier um, looking at the microbiome of atopic dermatitis, or eczema, so one of these itchy inflammatory skin conditions. What we saw was that during a disease flare-up, these atopic dermatitis patients lost their natural biodiversity that's, that's much more typical of the healthy skin, which you can see here in this control um, plot here, and with a very significant increase in the relative abundance of the staphylococci here in blue. And so from our studies of the skin microbiome and from uh, uh, those of others in the field, we converged on a central etiology for atopic dermatitis where the skin disease could be initiated, exacerbated, or recur by three major mechanisms driven either by microbial, uh, microbial pathogens or dysbiosis or these imbalances in the skin microbiome, defects in the barrier defenses of the skin, or actually a hyperallergenic uh, state where the immune system is responding too strongly to the different stimuli. And so this was kind of our test bed for, for developing a new type of therapeutic for AD, which is typically treated with things like antibiotics, steroids, things that don't work very well. There's a very high recurrence rate for this, um, for this disease. And so what we set out to do was to create an engineered probiotic to address these major disease factors. But, you know, before getting there, we came on, on some unique challenges. And among these was what I started out with, which is the skin site specificity. So our, our ideal microbial chassis has to be able to compete against many different existing communities, and at the same time also be stable, as well as have effective penetrance and stability in the skin. So in the end, you know, we had to come up with a new, uh, a new mi mic or not a new microbe, but identify a microbe that would make a good chassis. And so our first thought was to use one of the microbes that's already common in the skin, because we know that it can colonize the skin. Uh, moreover, it's generally safe if it's um, human derived. And so our first criteria was to identify a skin microbe that could grow in most of the di different skin sites. And so the way we did this is to, because we, didn't, we don't actually have a lot of hands-on knowledge about the different microbes in the, in the microbial communities of the skin, mostly because it's very difficult to culture or manipulate um, human-associated microbes. And so what we did is to take our metagenomic data and approximate microbial growth rate. And this is just based on the fact that bacteria that are growing very rapidly will have greater coverage of the DNA around the replication of origin where the bacteria are initiating uh, DNA synthesis. And so then, by looking at coverage of metagenomic reads across a genome, you can detect uh, this by looking at the ratio of the highest coverage to the highest coverage here to the lowest coverage there, where the high peak to trough ratio therefore indicates a much more rapidly growing population, in contrast to a PTR of basically one or flat right here, basically meaning that the microbe is not dividing or could be actually be dead. 
And so we did this for a lot of different microbes across the different skin sites. And what we found actually, you know, surprisingly, is that in a large proportion of skin sites, uh, most of the microbes or many of the microbes were actually stationary or dead, and that relatively few microbes were active in most skin sites. And among which was our microbe, uh, this microbe here on the, on the right, or left, Staph epidermidis. So maybe this would make a good candidate. It's active in most skin sites. It grows uh, relatively readily. But the challenge, the second challenge of using one's own microbes is that it also has to successfully compete against a lot of its own kind in the microbial community. And so what I mean by that is that for Staph epidermidis, not just the Staph epidermidis species exists in the skin, but multiple different strains of Staph epidermidis actually also exist. So what we've done is to develop different computational tools to also reconstruct strain diversity in addition to species diversity. And this is just a relative abundance plot of the different um, Staph epidermidis strains here. So each color here represents the relative abundance from this Staph epidermidis phylogenetic tree. And then we're looking at a time series here. So time point one to two is about a year. Time point two to three is about a month. And so each of these sets show, first of all, is that we have a lot of different Staph epidermidis strains in, our, in different skin sites, but also that they're pretty stable over time. So we're actually, you know, my, my given Staph epidermidis community is actually relatively refractory to obtaining new Staph epidermidis strains, for example, from the neighbor uh, that I was sitting, to, sitting next to earlier. So. Um, so what we've done is we've gone back to the, basis, uh, the basics, and we really want to identify features of Staph epidermidis, different strains that would make it basically a, a very effective colonizer in different environments. And so what we're doing is we're using different computational approaches to understand how these different strains are different, identifying genetic features that we can then engineer with CRISPRs and, and synthesis and approaches to really, in essence, create a, a engineer a Staph epidermidis that has genetic characteristics that makes it a more universal but also competitive colonizer. Because the implication here is that the genetic diversity that's encoded by all of those different Staph epidermidis strains, each has given it some kind of uh, benefit in terms of survival in the skin community. So we're really trying to harness those beneficial characteristics in order to make a, a super Staph epi strain. And so then for a disease like AD, you know, we, we want to address our AD triad of the microbe, the skin de defects, as well as the immune system. And so what we're doing is we're engineering our new Staph epidermidis to have a modular system so that we can then swap in and out different therapeutic parts, which in this case might be, for example, an anti-Staph aureus uh, biosensor, secrete different therapeutic proteins, or different anti-inflammatory molecules. And this is my final, oops, this is my final slide here. More generally, I just wanted to throw out there that the goal, my, my goal here is really to combine both metagenomics as well as synthetic biology, where, you know, the goal is really to arrive at a point by, we're able to characterize the microbial community, input many different characteristics of a microbial community using our shotgun sequencing, our computational approaches, to really then be able to create a mathematical model by which we can, um, you know, use this information about the characterization of the, the skin or the microbio microbiota that's there to really both identify and optimize uh, potential engineered probiotics, but then also predict the efficacy of its integration, as well as predict its impact on the host, as well as the microbial community. So that's it. This is my lab at the Jackson Laboratory. And thanks very much also to, to my collaborators there. OK. Very interesting. Um, I was wondering um, if one of your goal is to go to the clinics. Uh, what is the? What's the? What are the odds that uh, Aureus will become a hypercolonizer or that Epidermidis will become a high uh, pathogen? Ah, uh, so Just they, they kind of swap. They swap walls. Yeah, that's yeah, a through, good. Through that's horizontal a great question. Transfer. And uh, many people actually before who have spoken before me today have addressed that in terms of making them less compatible. For example, some of the codon engineering I think would be a very effective way to do that. I mean, so right now we've done I think the easier things like make kill switches to you know target our recombinant microbe. But you know again that doesn't prevent things like horizontal gene transfer. And we're actually trying to just biologically characterize what is the maximum rate of of HGT between different staphylococcal species, just to understand what would be the maximum possible risk. Yep. 
Um, so you're optimizing this chassis as like a biosensor and a delivery vehicle. How do you test it? And you can't grow it, can't grow it. What do you find patients to do experiments on? Or what are you uh, so, do? The nice, so the nice part about Staph epidermis is unlike some of the other skin microbes that I, um, I mentioned, is that we can actually cultivate and grow it. So we're actually doing in vitro as well as mouse studies to, um, to, to check out it, the, the activity of the things that um, we're putting in. So, okay. All right. Thanks very much.